So we are going to move on to our first speaker. And this is Mr. Kevin Martis. Kevin is a county commissioner for Lynn Alwee, is that correct? Lenaway. Lenaway, sorry, county in Michigan. He is a zoning administrator for Deerfield Township. He spent the last 15 years in utility scale renewable zoning and is often called upon for his expertise. And he's testified before legislative committees in Ohio and Michigan. So please help me in giving Kevin a warm welcome. I'll grab it for you right now. Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you. It's you a click. privilege to be here with you tonight. Um, I will say these are dark days indeed when the fine people of Ohio need to turn to a Michigan man for help. <laughs> oh, I won't say more. I said that five years ago when you guys were whooping us year after year, and it was, it's a little more satisfying tonight. <laughs> um, I am a certified zoning administrator. I also am a Lenaway County Commissioner. And let me share uh, a couple thoughts with you. Um, one is that um, if you are a commissioner or an official or a regulator and you're dealing with this project, I've sat on your side of the table. And I understand what it's like to look at a community divided. I understand how hard it is to try and make those decisions. And often it's something we never thought we would be dealing with when we took office. And so I'm fully sympathetic with uh, that side of the discussion because I've been sitting on that side of the table all the way back to 2005. I would also give a quick word to citizens and activists who are trying to persuade policymakers uh, to adopt their policy position. And it's just this little simple thought. If you want people to adopt your policy position, it's best that they like you. So think about that as you're interacting with people and you're trying to persuade them to your way of thinking. It's best that they like you. I want another quick disclaimer. Even though I am an official in two, two different units of government, I am not speaking on behalf of those units of government tonight. Secondly, unlike Ohio, we had township zoning uh, and county zoning for wind and solar until November 29, 2023. We have lost our regulatory ability in the townships in Michigan and it's now all at the Public uh, Service Commission. Three-person board approves all projects, and in essence, any project proposed will be approved because of the language that's in the new law. Um, we're looking at 350,000 acres of solar over the next decade. Um, I have started a coalition to repeal that law, and we're doing a citizen's ballot initiative, and so we're working very hard on that. We have some prominent statewide stakeholders who have joined us in the state of Michigan, including the Michigan Township Association and Michigan Farm Bureau, and so, of course, um, I want to make it clear, none of my thoughts today, today are on behalf of those two entities, neither am I speaking on the behalf of our group Citizens for Local Choice tonight. My thoughts are uh, just my own. I was going to stay out of solar zoning because I had donated my time to uh, people all across the Midwest who were struggling with wind energy zoning, and I said I had done enough and didn't want to continue. Uh, and so I said, somebody else will have to take up the ball if they want to assist on solar zoning issues. Um, and then this project was proposed in my community. And so suddenly I had to get very involved. Um, and of course, there's a whole new set of data you need to put together uh, to understand what you're dealing with. This is the Carroll Road Solar Farm. And it, the red area is in Deerfield Township, where I now serve as zoning administrator. And the orange part is in Riga Township, where I live. And together, it was a couple thousand acres all total. Now, the farmers on our township board were very concerned about keeping agriculture in production, so they adopted zoning regulations that allowed some solar, but primary goal was to protect uh, agriculture. Now that ordinance has been thrown out and will be moot November 29th of this year if we're not successful with our petition drive. Here's a close-up of the uh, project, and you can, of course, see the houses there and the solar panels. Uh, it's, particularly troubling because this ground is literally some of the best in the Midwest hosting vegetable crops, orchards, as well as cash crops. Um, projects are growing. This is already a couple years old. The Mammoth Solar Farm in Indiana is among the largest at 13,000 acres. And in my county alone, um, we're looking right now, I'm aware of 15,000 acres of solar. So as we look at your options moving forward, you may be concerned about one or two projects right now, but realize your county's actions and the Power Siting Board's actions will also be looking down the road at maybe many more projects. The money that's being poured into this space by federal policy is tremendous, and there's many people looking to take advantage of that. 
Normally I'd be doing a zoning talk because that's what my uh, talk leads up to because a local unit of government is going to create a set of regulations to try and you know, find a compatible way to have these uh, incompatible uses function in the same community. Under Ohio law, you don't have that uh, locally except for small projects, and I'm sure most of you are aware of that. Um, until a couple of years ago, the Ohio Power, Power Siting Board was the final authority on these things, but now the county has some new tools, which I'll address just briefly. Um, and of course, I want to be clear, there are two paths forward. You have projects that are grandfathered in, and you guys are probably aware of this, which means the new law doesn't affect those projects, that the OPSB still retains ultimate authority on those. And then of course, you have the new projects that would be subject to the new law, which gives your county a chance to speak out on that. Um, Regarding the Ohio Power Siting Board, I have testified before them, and I want to make it clear that um, I have found them to be professional and committed to protecting the public interest. So let's think about solar. Every developer I've interacted with since 2009 leads with the money. Money, money, money. That's the constant discussion. And so how about an honest look at the cost-benefit? Well, of course, the developer size pushes the benefits, the financial benefits. Um, and of course, large landowners will uh, uh, profit tremendously, and of course, local units of government will get some tax revenue, but that's often at risk due to changes in tax policy going forward, and it's often offset by a number of expenses that the communities incur by hosting these projects. The other thing I find amazing, when I started out in this space, the average lease payment for solar uh, ground was $800 to $1,000 per acre per year, but we're now seeing offers as high as $2,500 per acre per year with a 2% escalator, and this is up in the thumb. So there's no question large landowners benefit handsomely, and I don't begrudge them that. Um, and here, if you're questioning the 2,500, you can see I've highlighted it there. That's the highest I've seen. That's, that's on the high end, to be sure. Um, but what about the cost side of the ledger? So sure, some folks are going to profit, but what are the costs? Well, the farmers in my township, or in Deerfield Township, where I serve as zoning administrator, went to MSU uh, Extension and had their economists do an analysis of the losses to the ag economy by converting just 1,600 acres of prime farm ground to solar. And Dr. Miller did that analysis for us. And his conclusion on 1,600 acres out of production converted to power generation, you would see about $1.5 million per year in annual losses to the Lenawee County ag economy or $52.5 million over the 35-year uh, projected lifespan of that project. Furthermore, they suggested there be, just from that one project, a loss of about eight jobs in the ag industry. And in my county, I know of eight projects this size, which you can then start to multiply the effect on this. There could be enough ground taken out of production in my county that our local elevators and chemical suppliers may not have enough market share left to split among number, a number of vendors. So there can be profound harm. And in fact, I think that's in part why the Michigan Agribusiness Association and the Michigan Farm Bureau were so opposed to the uh, preemption of local control of zoning, because they see it's a direct, it will, can have a direct impact on their business interest. We often hear this story, it's important to hear to, to save the family farm. We need solar to save the family farm. Uh, but is that true for all farmers? Well, with the kind of money that's being offered, there's no question uh, people hosting solar projects will have a tremendous financial windfall. That's beyond dispute. But often these farm parcels are not actually owned by family farmers. In my county, Ceres Corporation from Indiana is buying up a lot of farm ground, and I believe they're doing it all across the Midwest, and one of their uh, business model plans includes converting that to solar because of the rate of return on those investments. So my point is, Ceres can do that, it's lawful, but my point is, money going to a corporation isn't a family farm that's benefiting. But how about tenant farmers? This is a voice we don't hear represented very often. Typically, half of your average farm operation involves leased ground. In one case, in Monroe County, 700 acre farmer, they own 150 and lease 550. All 550 of the ground that they've been leasing is under lease for solar, which means if that ground's converted to solar, that family farmer will be out of business. There won't be enough ground left. And secondly, when you start concentrating that much money into the hands of a small number of landowners, good luck winning the next equipment auction or the land auction. In other words, the money that flows is highly disruptive to rural agricultural economics. And we've already heard this addressed once, but what about private property rights? Personally, I lean libertarian. In fact, there was a time I wanted to repeal our zoning ordinance in my township. 
then when you see how important it is to have to have a mechanism to separate conflicting uses of land, you realize maybe that's a little uh, um, too uh, uh, myopic to look at it in such a close uh, fashion. And then I went to a place like Montana, which doesn't have much zoning at all, even there, what they have instead is very strong presumptive nuisance laws on the books. So rather than regulating conflicting land uses, it makes it very easy for you to win a case against your neighbor for adopting a use that's adverse to your interest. So we recognize that the right to swing our fists ends where our neighbor's nose begins. And that's the basic premise of land use policy. So can I do whatever I want on my private property? I'll be brief here because it's been addressed well already. Most of us, and I think most people here in this county, live in zoned communities. Zoning, by definition, means you cannot do whatever you want on your private property. If you have zoning that allows everybody to do whatever they want on their private property, it's not zoning anymore. Um, land use in zoned communities is a community decision. Secondly, nobody really believes this. Everybody says, I should be able to do whatever I want on my private property. And while they may mean that about them, they never mean that about their neighbors. Everybody likes zoning that applies to their neighbor, but not to them. Do you really want your neighbor the right to put in a 24-hour-a-day truck stop, an adult bookstore, a landfill? Of course not. We have to separate those uses. We need to protect places like churches, nursing homes, daycares, elementary schools. With, if you're going to advance the point that you think I should be able to do whatever I want on my private property, then you should go to the legislature and ask them to repeal whatever your Zoning Enabling Act is so that we all equally can do whatever we want with our private property. And I've hit these points already. How about this one? Should this be a compelling argument? I can make more money by converting my ground to solar. Well, it's certainly true, but it's also true for almost any other land use you can imagine. We have a cheap food policy in the United States. We keep the value of land low, agricultural land low. We protect it from development for subdivisions and other types of sprawling uses to keep the supply of land high. In exchange for those loss of uh, property value appreciation, which is part of the policy, we give generous support to agricultural producers in the form of direct subsidies, indirect subsidies, tax policy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, solar is more valuable than your other use, but so is subdivision, so are housing development, so is everything else. In other words, we already know that, and that's why we have laws in place to protect ground from being converted to other uses. Here's another one, and it's been addressed as well. Solar ground will revert to ag at the end of the project life. That's what we heard in my township for two years, and the planning commissioner actually said, I'm sure this will be virgin soil when we're all done. But will it? Well, there's a couple issues. In Michigan, our regulated utilities are so well capitalized, they're not renting ground for 1,000 or 2,000 an acre. Why would they when they can buy it for 10 or 15? So they are buying it. They're looking for 160,000 acres. Now, at the end of 25 years, is consumers of Detroit Edison really going to sell that acreage and buy the, the next section and move all that? Of course not. But secondly, if solar really is the energy source of the future, why would we ever decommission a solar farm? You never would. You would just change the panels, change the inverters, and keep going. And thirdly, once that project's established, it's grandfathered in. Because, as you can see in this room, solar zoning is contentious, once you have a project approved, you're going to continue to keep that in place just as long as it's financially viable. So in other words, the ground that's coming out of production 100 years from now is likely still going to be out of production. So understanding these things, and keep in mind, there's a hundred other things we could talk about with solar, but time is limited, and because you don't have the option of local zoning, there's no sense talking about noise or glare or screening or mounting or, or zoning districts. It's just not a tool in your box. But what can you and your commissioners in Knox County do? For projects that are grandfathered in, they still remain before the power siting board. As I said, you want people who are making your policy decisions to like you. You want to make well-reasoned arguments based in science, and you want to demonstrate, like you are today, that there's strong community opposition uh, to this development here, that you see it as adverse to your uh, land use plans going forward as a community. That's the things that they are looking at. Newer projects that are not grandfathered in are now subject to SB 52. Uh, there's a whole guidebook on this if your commissioners aren't familiar. If not, I'm sure the folks here will get one to you. 
Um, it now gives your commissioners for new projects the ability to designate all or part of the county, or the unincorporated parts of the county, off limits for wind and or solar development. If they decide to inhibit a project through this mechanism, the county residents would then have a right to place that matter before the people through referendum, if they so choose, and there's a process for that. And I won't go into all the detail on this, but the bottom line is you got a two-fold path. Grandfathered ones, you still have to talk to the Power Siting Board. Uh, new ones, you can create these uh, uh, regulations internally. You can do these restrictions locally. And depending on how you do it, in most cases, it would be subject to referendum. So what's been the effect of this law? Some of you may be aware that a wind project um, in Crawford County was proposed by Apex Clean Energy. And uh, the county commission there voted to inhibit the project. Apex did exercise their right to place that matter on the ballot through referendum. Uh, a lot of money was spent, and the election results came out, and the county's ban on that project was supported three to one. What's interesting is in every precinct that voted, including remote precincts and cities that were not directly affected, the margins were still 65-35 to three to one. So the county overwhelmingly spoke against that project. And it's not just Ohio where we see this. In my county, in Palmyra Township, which is in my commission district, a solar project was proposed. The township board adopted a strong solar ordinance that protected farm ground. The developer placed it on the ballot, and the people supported that strong ordinance three to one. The developer spent about 70000 bucks on PR, and the people spent $2,500. And they still prevailed three to one. Milan Township, which is in my next county over, um, their board had some conflicted people on the board. Uh, they felt they were voting in their own interest. They placed a number of them up for recall. Again, same margin, three to one, three to one. And in Michigan, we've had 29 township referenda on wind energy, which is partially the reason Governor Whitmer's taking away our rights because they're tired of the people speaking. 29 referenda in a row, and the wind companies have never won. 29 out of 29. So one of the questions that I've been asked to address is, will your county get sued if they exercise their rights under SB 52? Well, let me be clear. I'm not a lawyer. I do watch Law and Order, but I'm not a lawyer. Um, can somebody sue? Sure. Only costs a few hundred bucks to go file suit. I mean, I can't guarantee that won't happen, but I have a hard time believing anybody can prevail by simply exercising the county's statutory rights afforded to them under SB 52. To any commissioners or officials who might be in the room, the referendum opportunity gives you a unique, a unique chance to gauge public sentiment. It's always hard for us to know because we typically don't have budgets for polling. Usually you can't put opinion matters on the ballot in most states. How do you know what your people want? Well, if you decide to declare an area off limits in your county, the developer and their supporters can place that matter on the ballot. Then the people will get a chance to vote. If the people vote to repeal that ban, you will know that your people, in fact, want the solar development to continue. And if they support the ban, then you still will know you had a chance to represent the folks. My point is this is a mechanism to give your people a chance to speak so they can decide rather than you trying to guess what your people want across the county. So wrapping up. There are a host of known issues associated with converting large tracts of ag land into power generation. As I said several times, in most states, you'd be able to deal with that at the township or the county level. And you could try and regulate them in a way that balances private property rights versus community interest. The Ohio state of Ohio has simply given you a more of a blunt instrument, which is you can now ban new projects in any or all of the unincorporated parts of the county. So let me be clear. In the end, I don't care what you do. I don't live here. This is your community. Um, but if you think that the best place for utility-scale solar is, in fact, not on prime farm ground, but rather on rooftops, rights, road rights of way, interstate highway right of ways, um, brownfields, uh, commercial and industrial rooftops, you do have a mechanism to do that. You can ban the new projects on farm ground, and you can write regulations, because they'd be under 50 megawatts, to advance those types of uses in any fashion you want. I'm not here to say whether solar is good or bad, or wind is good or bad. My public record is out there. Uh, you, that's a decision for you guys to make for yourself, and I'm sure Robert will have some things to add to that. But most communities in my state, before the governor took away our control, has decided the place they'd like to see solar, if they're going to have it, is on brown fields and on rooftops. And that's all I have. So thank you very much.